Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, during this Christmas season, we just take a moment and pause and we remember that you came to us as one of us and that you are still with us today. May we feel your presence here this morning as we gather together to worship you. We pray that you would accept our singing, accept our words and our offerings as just a small token of our thankfulness, our thankfulness and our gratitude for you sending Jesus Christ, your only son, into this world to bring us into a wonderful, everlasting relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, we invite you to stand and let's sing our opening hymn together. Hymn number 142, Angels We Have Heard on High.
Welcome to church. We hope you're having a wonderful holiday season with your family and friends. Take a look at the bulletin. There's a number of announcements under the church life section and a lot of thank yous and appreciations and a few announcements you want to take note of. We're approaching the end of the year and many of you want to make sure you get your year end giving in. Uh, Today and next Sabbath will be the last two opportunities at church to do that. And because of the dates, uh, the 31st and the 1st of January, the office will be closed. So you might want to, if you're not able to be here next week, uh, mail your uh, donations in if you want them to be recorded this year. Appreciate very much the increased giving that's been coming to the church in the last two months. We're getting down toward the end and we're getting close to meeting our budget fully, but we'll need a little more help and we appreciate your generosity in supporting the church. I want to make sure that uh, someone's not missing a set of keys. If you are, check with me before you go home today or you won't go home. <laughs> you know, uh, every once in a while, change takes place, and sometimes change is sad. Today we want to, we don't want to, but we have to say farewell to a longtime supporter of our church. Susan Cosano has been singing in our choir for 27 years, and today is her last day. She's moving on to new endeavors, and we as a church want to say, Susan, if you'd stand please. Thank you for your <laughs> gift of music to us. We send God's blessings with you. I'd like to invite uh, Kelly Fontamellas and Marina Ferriero up. You know, uh, in our church, we are endeavoring to try some new things for families. We even have a new family pastor in Peter Baptiste and have many good things coming and you'll soon, soon see that even in the worship service. But a couple of weeks ago we had a great Saturday night program and these two lovely ladies made it possible by working with our children and they're going to give you a report on that. You'll see the pictures as well. Merry Christmas. Hi, church. Uh, it's great to see you. Uh, when Pastor uh, Mark invited us to come and tell you a little bit about what the party was, um, Kelly didn't want to at first because she's like, this sounds like I'm coming over here to toot my own horn. <laughs> so I said, wait, hold on, no. Um, she came up with an amazing idea of putting together a Christmas party for the kids at our, at our church. And at first we thought we were just going to have maybe like 10 or 12 kids, but it ended up being like a huge thing. We had over 40 kids plus all the parents. It was a great opportunity for some of us Sabbath school teachers or children's worship teachers to get to meet the parents of those older kids that we don't get to see. Because when you're beginners, babies come over with the parents. But as the kids get older, you don't get to meet the whole family. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, we got to play. We did some crafts. Um, we sang. It was a lot of fun. Um, and we realized that there was a need. Well. Kelly realized that there was a need, and she did something about it. So <laughs> we want to invite all of you that were there and the ones that weren't but are looking at the clip right now to, if this is something that may sound fun to you, to help us out for next year, we would like to maybe get a little committee together and divide activities because this was only possible because literally last minute, tons of people came over and said, hey, can I help with the kitchen? Can I help with the games? Can I help? And that's how it happened, and it was great. So uh, we would love it if there's more of you interested in uh, doing something like this. And even an idea came up from the parents that night, which is maybe doing this on a regular basis. Maybe not every Sabbath, and maybe not with such uh, so many details, you know? But maybe a once a month family night where we can get together and build our community. We have a great church here. We have tons of activities for kids 
But we want the parents, we want to see the parents too. We want to be able to see you as a family and enjoy it and become closer to each other. So that's my part. <laughs> I'll let Kelly. And even though we had a lot of fun activities for the children, a lot of them said the singing was their favorite part. And we have a little uh, clip to show of that too. like these and hopefully make this an annual Christmas event as well so please see one of us if you'd like to be a part of it and now while you're watching the rest of the pictures we're gonna invite the children to come forward for children's story and um, parents and adults please greet each other with love Parents and families, I would like to, as usual, remind you that on Wednesday nights, we have a special ministry going on, both for parents and for kids. Um, not necessarily for parents. You don't have to be a parent, is what I'm saying. But <laughs> um, we're, we have a Bible study for adults. And at the same time as we do that Bible study, we have a program for kids on Wednesday nights. We're not going to be meeting this Wednesday. But starting January 3rd, we're going to start up again. It's going to be the full program. So please don't forget Koinonia on Wednesday nights. It starts at 7. And Koinonia kids. All right. Good morning, everybody. Do you know that in two days it's going to be Christmas? Yeah. Who's excited? Me. Yeah? Christmas. You guys, tomorrow's Christmas Eve. That's right, huh? You guys so excited? We're celebrating yeah. Christmas. Yeah, you're excited? Good. All right. Let's see. Let's make some room here, guys. Can you move your feet, guys? So you can sit down. There we go. Okay. Well, many, 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 many years ago, something happened. Did you guys, last night, did you guys see a big, bright light across the sky? Did you guys see that? Did you know what it was? Did you know what it was when you first saw it? Or did you have to find out? <laughs> did it scare you? <laughs> I remember. What was it, Aaliyah? It was a rocket trip. My dad saw it. It was a rocket, right? A rocket being launched into space. It was carrying satellites. So that's pretty cool. But if that was the first time that you saw that, you might think, oh, what's happening? Did anybody think that it was aliens? No. No. I might have if I saw it. Did anybody think it was um, Santa Claus? No. <laughs> All right. Well, 
The first time I saw a big rocket launch like that, I got so scared. I was like, what is going on? I was in Arizona, and it was dark in Arizona. But I could see the rocket launch in California. The sun hadn't set yet in California. And I could see it all the way in Arizona. I could see the thing going up, and then I saw the, the second phase start and all that steam or whatever it is that comes out, the, the fuel that comes out. It was crazy. I was like, what is that? I realized later that it was a rocket launch, but that scared me. Oh, man. Now, many, many years ago, there was a girl, and she was just hanging out in her room. She was probably sleeping, and some bright light filled her room, <gasps> and she was really scared. Would you be scared if a bright light all of a sudden filled your room? Do you know? It was an angel, and Mary was scared. But do you know what the angel said? That's right. It's what the angels always say in the Bible, right? They always say, Do not be afraid. That's right. They always say, Do not be afraid. And then he told Mary, You are blessed among women. Yes, and she was going to get a special gift, wasn't she? So no matter what happens, no matter what happens, God is always taking care of us, and he's always reminding us, do not be afraid. And don't forget that you always have your guardian angel with you, too. So do not be afraid. All right. It's time for children's worship. So if you... Yeah. <laughs> so you may go up to children's worship quietly and slowly. And I hope you have a wonderful Christmas. Will the deacons please come forward? Christmas is a giving season. Now, many historians credit Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, a major influence upon how we think of Christmas and the way in which we celebrate it. Dickens was heavily in debt and needed to get money for his family. So he completed writing this short narrative in six weeks, just in time for Christmas, 1843. This well-loved story tells of the conversion of Ebenezer Scrooge from a, a man imprisoned by greed into a free man full of compassion and generosity. We also have experienced conversion and are made free by God's greatest gift of Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate, commemorate, remember at Christmas. We can respond by giving tithes and offerings so that our church will continue to be a blessing to our community and the world. Please give with your heart. The offering today is for the conference church building and the loose offering is for the church budget. The deacons may now collect the offering.
us pray. Dear God, bless these tithes and offerings. Multiply them as the loaves and fishes were multiplied and help them to do good for the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a joyous day to be here, gathered together. And um, I wish you could see what I see. You, you are resplendent in your colors, and you look wonderful. Merry Christmas. I would like to invite those people with special prayer requests and those who would like to come forward. And also would like to invite, if anyone has a spoken request that they would like to share with our church family. Would you come forward as we sing our song, as we come to you in prayer, hymn 671. Beloved Jesus, we celebrate you today. Today we call you Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, 
the Prince of Peace. And of all of these, I beseech you today for that peace we so need in our hearts, the peace that only you can provide. We have noted the words at the entrance to this, your sanctuary, which read, Be still and know that I am. Why is it, Lord, that we have such a hard time being still and are devoid, are not devoid of our human anxieties? We know that nation fights with nation every day somewhere. And through every situation, we should not despair for we know that our salvation is the gift we share from your love, which gives birth to our love. We gather to sing familiar words, Be still, my soul. Thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul. The waves and winds still know his voice, who ruled them when he dwelt with us. Be still, my soul. The hour is hastening on when we shall be forever with our Lord. There are those who have griefs. There are those who have come forward here in some unspoken prayer, Lord, listen to their hearts. There is illness, as we always have this time of year. I noticed Joel was not singing with us because he has a very bad respiratory infection. Jesus, we know you are on our side. Help us to let go, let go of old bruises, old grudges, and most of all, that desire to be right. Instead of being right, teach us to be loving. Give us your light, your love, your peace that began our salvation that holy night. So, God, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Today's scripture reading will be found in Luke 1, 26 through 38. And I will be reading from the New International Version. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you 
and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be to me fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Amen. Well, thanks so much for that wonderful reading. Question for you guys, and maybe you can tell me the answer to this afterwards. Um, when was the last time you were genuinely, really, really surprised about something? Um, I was thinking about this the other day, and um, when I was just overjoyed and really surprised was when I was about 15 years old, and I really wanted a new electric guitar. I didn't have one. All my guitar heroes had one. I was listening to all that kind of stuff. But I, all we had in the house was my mum's old classical guitar. It was all battered up. It had about four strings. They were out of tune. There was no way I could, I could practice and learn to play guitar on this thing. But my parents told me that we couldn't afford an electric guitar. So they kind of like led me along on all the months leading up to Christmas. So I was really down in the dumps for a long time. But the great surprise was when I indeed came downstairs about four o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day and I saw this uh, guitar-shaped Christmas present under the, under the tree. And to my joy and delight and surprise, I opened it and I never, never looked back. It was what got me into guitar playing. Um, I still love to play. And actually, that's one of my resolutions next year, uh, is to start playing more guitar. I've kind of put that on the back burner a bit in the last few years, but I definitely want to start playing more next year. And again, I'd be interested to know what your guys' resolutions are, if you have any. Tell me afterwards, I'd be, I'd be interested to know. But kind of a more serious question, something that, you know, goes beyond just the superficial resolutions that we make. Um, I want, and I hope you already have thought about this, but what are the spiritual resolutions that you're going to make? Uh, how are you going to make more room for God in your life? in 2018. Now I want to get straight into the readings for today. We're actually going to go to a place in the Bible which might seem a bit unusual at first, but hopefully we'll be able to tie it all together. So if you wouldn't mind, if you have a hard copy of the Bible, if you, if you have it electronically, that's okay too. But I want you to have uh, this verse on hand, 2 Samuel chapter 7. I'll be talking about a few of those verses, but if you could turn to 2 Samuel Chapter 7, that's a book in the Old Testament, if you didn't know. If you didn't know that, then we'll have to have a chat afterwards. Second Samuel chapter 7. And this story focuses, of course, on King David. Now, just to give you a bit of a background here, David has just won his victory over King Saul. David is now Israel's king, and he finally has rest from all of his surrounding enemies. And so, in response to what God has done for David, David decides to do something special for God. He wants to show his gratitude for God. So, in 2 Samuel 7, verses 1 and 2, you'll read, After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, this is David talking, he says, here I am living in this house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. You know what we mean by that tent, right? It's the sanctuary that was set up and taken down in, in the wilderness. That was where God was residing at the moment. And David didn't feel good about that. David feels guilty because he's living in this luxurious, uh, really wonderful palace. And God is living in this mobile tent. And so David decides he wants to build a temple, wants to build a house for God. Sounds like a nice thing to do, yeah? Sounds like a good plan. But interestingly, God is not actually thrilled with that idea. And so then God responds to David through Nathan, the prophet, and in verse 5 you'll read, Go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, and God's talking sort of 
with a bit of irony here. God says to David, should you build me a house to dwell in? See, God informs David here that David doesn't need to do anything for him. And God kind of, interestingly, turns the tables, explaining that it is he who is going to establish a house for David. Now, there's kind of a wordplay going on here. God obviously doesn't mean he's going to establish a literal house for David. No, God is talking about establishing a royal house for David, uh, a family line that will succeed him. And it's interesting, isn't it? Here's David so focused on what he can do for God, he completely forgets that really the spiritual life is all about God's grace. It's not about what you can do for God. It's about what God has already done for you. God is always the one who initiates first. God is always the one who offers his grace before you've done anything to deserve it. So what does God do? Well, as we said, he makes this promise to David. He uh, promises David a long family lineage that will continue to rule long after David has gone. In verse 16, in the same chapter, it says, God again promising to David, your house and your kingdom will endure for how long? Forever. Forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. That is the expectation that David had, this everlasting kingdom. As you think about that expectation, what about your own life? What are the expectations that you have for your own life next year? And will God be faithful in keeping his promises to you? Now, things didn't work out very well for David. King, uh, the, 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 the kingdom lasted for about 400 years. It's a bit of a history kind of lesson here, which is a really long time. That's a good innings, isn't it? 400 years, pretty good. But David's kingdom did not seem to last forever. As you may or may not know, in the year uh, 586 BC, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem, destroyed it, took the Israelites into captivity. David's royal house had come to an end. God's promise of an everlasting future was left unfulfilled. Do you ever feel like God's promises for you are unfulfilled? Maybe all those prayers that you offered up in 2017, maybe they still haven't been answered. Maybe you're still stuck in a job that you hate. Maybe you still haven't found that life partner. Maybe you're still really struggling to make ends meet financially. Maybe you've just lost all sense of direction in your life. Maybe you're still suffering from loneliness, brokenness, anxiety, depression, and you ask yourself, where is God? Why isn't God fulfilling the promises that he made to me? Well, you know what? I'm sure every Jew asked themselves that question as they reflected on losing their home, on losing their land, losing their possessions, losing their family. I'm sure when the Jews looked around and saw their oppressors ruling over them, they asked exactly the same thing. Where is God? And let's be honest, sometimes we don't feel like we know where God is, do we? Sometimes God does seem silent. Sometimes God does seem non-existent, distant feels like our prayers are falling on deaf ears. Sometimes it feels like they're falling on no ears. But here's the thing. Even when they didn't know where God was, even when they didn't understand 
quite what God was up to, they never lost their faith. Even when their everlasting kingdom that didn't seem so everlasting, even when that kingdom was shattered, even when everything they were experiencing in their life and their circumstances suggested that God had failed them, they continued to remember the promise that God had made. And interestingly, most scholars say that the book of 2 Samuel was actually written a lot later than the story that it tells, written in the 6th century, written while the Jews were in captivity in Babylon. Get the point? Right in the middle of their suffering, the Jews decided to write about God's promises. They decided to tell stories about God's promises. They decided to remember and have faith in God's promises, no matter how things around them seemed. So maybe that's exactly where you are in your life right now. A really low point for you, perhaps. I don't know. Maybe you're still waiting expectantly for God's promises to take fruition in your life. Well, then I can tell you, friends, Christmas is the time for you. Because, as our reading told us uh, earlier, you skip forward 600 years, it's a long time to wait, 600 years forward in history from the time of Babylonian captivity, Israel still has no king, Israel is still estranged from God, still under foreign rule, still oppressed, still hoping for an everlasting kingdom, and still waiting for God's promise to come true. But then, all of a sudden, God does something. God intervenes. God sends his angel to a virgin, engaged to a man named Joseph. Now, if you look in the passage of the scripture we read in Luke chapter 1, verse 27, you'll see what jumps off the page as Joseph is introduced. Joseph is not just some guy. Joseph is not some random man. It says that Joseph is from where? The house of David. See, when you know a little bit about the history, you'll notice just how important that small remark is. God is not just enacting some brand new miracle. No, God is fulfilling the 600 years old promise that he made to David, bringing a new king into the world who will rule over Israel and rule over every nation. See, God hadn't forgotten his promise at all. In fact, God was always fulfilling it, but he was doing so quietly, clandestinely, hiddenly, slowly, but now, at Christmas time, the time was right for the promise to find its true fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. See, we don't always see what God is up to, but God is always up to something. And the season of Advent, the season of Christmas, it reminds us to wait faithfully for God's promises to be fulfilled. And it also reminds us that God's promises are often fulfilled in rather unexpected, unpredictable ways, doesn't it? Now you, you probably have an exact idea in your head, right, about how God needs to answer your prayers next year. But I'm wondering, and speaking for myself as well, I'm wondering if some of our ideas for our prayers being answered, I wonder if some of those ideas need to be, need to be modified, need to be changed a little. Because yes, God fulfills the promise to put an everlasting king on the throne. But notice how unpredictable that fulfillment is. Because Surely the king of Israel should arrive with power. 
but Christ arrives as a helpless, naked baby. And the king of Israel should arrive with money. Christ arrives as the son of a peasant family, his father a carpenter and his mother a 13-year-old nobody, about as low as you can get on the social scale. And surely the king of Israel should arrive with recognition. But Christ doesn't come to Jerusalem, the religious, the political, the cultural center of the world. No, Christ arrives in Nazareth, that dirty, poverty-stricken town of which it was said, nothing good can come from Nazareth. Friends, if Christmas means anything, it is that God fulfills his promises in ways you could never predict. So I can't tell you what next year will bring. I don't know. Maybe some of the things you've been praying for will be answered. Maybe other prayers you'll just have to be more patient with. But I guarantee a lot of your hopes and dreams for yourself will be answered, but in unexpected ways. But just know God never forgets you, and he is answering you in his own time and in his own way. So what can you do? Well, what you, the one thing you can control is your attitude. It's your stance before God. And I think in, in, in that sense, I think Mary in the story is the perfect example for us. Why is she the perfect example? Simply because Mary is completely open to God's action in her life. Verse 35 says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So if you want to have a, a deep and lasting joy in 2018, that's what it's all about. Letting God's Spirit overshadow you. Is that something you're willing to do? See, it's Mary's openness, her willingness to let God use her. Her, her, her willingness to cooperate with God's will and to put her future entirely in his hands. That's what makes Mary such a shining example for us. Lastly, Mary says in verse 38, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Do you have the courage to say the same thing next year? Do you have the courage to say, I am a servant of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Do you have the courage to say, God, I'm going to put my own expectations on hold next year. and I'm just going to embrace your faithfulness to me and be open to you fulfilling your promises in my life in new unexpected, unpredictable ways. And God, I want you to do that on your terms, not my own. That, I think, is the stance that we need to take next year. It's not about getting what you want. It's not about having your agenda agreed to by God. It's about living your life with this extreme and radical openness to God. Simply letting God be faithful to you and allowing him to fulfill his promises to you in unexpected ways. I hope that's a message that we can all uh, take in our hearts today as we look forward to a new year. And I invite you, just before we close, to stand and let's sing with joy our closing hymn. Stand with me. Our last... <laughs>
may you take hold of God's promises to you this Christmas. And may you be open to letting God surprise you and fulfill his promises in ways that you never expected. May we all, with Mary, declare, we are servants of you, Lord. Let it be done to us according to your will. Amen. You guys have a wonderful day and have a wonderful Merry Christmas.